All right, welcome to our class, Hermeneutics. We're gonna be getting into a study here a little bit more on how we can ascertain the understanding of an author and what he means by words and phrases and sentences and things. Uh, I'm gonna to try to move a little bit quickly, actually, because I wanna start getting into some of the other things that I've been looking forward to, uh, because quite frankly, there's, there's a lot that can go into, you know, how we can understand what an author really means when he says what he says. So I know that we could, we could really spend a lot of time on this. So I wanna kinda of move ahead after maybe a week or two, this week and maybe next week or something like that. But before we get into our class, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day today. Help us to understand and those who are watching online, those who we interact with, to understand that there is one truth, that you have one faith which you've given to us which has been once for all delivered to the saints and that if there's any other gospel that is preached among men then those who do so and those who are brought in by it will be accursed lord help us to be diligent soldiers to fight the good fight of faith to be bold to to stand firm and uh, put on the armor that you've given us, Lord, uh, having done all to stand. Help us to understand how to study your word and how to know your word in such a way that though men may speak against it, it cannot be successfully spoken against. Help us to understand your word so that we can know you better that we can receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls, that we would rightly divide your truth, that we would be workmen who are studiers, who are diligently studying your word so that we would be approved by you. Help us, Father, to stand fast, to stand firm, and uh, to not give place uh, to the devil, to not give place to fear or to uh, the uh, disapproval of men. Lord, help us to be uh, concerned with being approved by you and to please you rather than men. Help us not to be dismayed by their looks, by their words, and by what they do. Be with us in our study here today. Give us peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord, as we make our request known to you in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Help it to guard our hearts and minds in your Son, Jesus Christ. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, we're going to take a look at <clears throat> understanding the purpose of an author quickly by looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. I want to look at, you know, sometimes we, we can see what uh, the book or the letter, the purpose of the book or the letter or the statement is. Uh, by directly having these statements that are made. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians, we're going to look at four or five examples that help us see uh, you know, direct statements uh, of, of what the author is trying to get across. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, so Paul comes in, he begins his book with the greeting. And in that, he says in verse 10, he says, I plead with you, brethren, so he's talking to Christians, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, by the way, um, if we didn't know whether or not he was talking to Christians or not, we could look at a couple things. One, verse 1, Paul, uh, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, okay? So he's writing to Christians, and then he calls them brethren, and he says it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know he's talking to Christians, and he says that you all 
speak the same thing. And, and this, is, this is actually something that's been really burdensome on my heart lately. Because Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that there is one faith, that there is one Lord, that there is one body, okay? And in the book of Ephesians, that body is called the church. Same, same thing in Corinthians, or Colossians. It's called the church. The church has one. The church and the body are the same thing. They're synonymous. There's one body, one church. There's one head over the church. There's one faith, which means there's one word of God. There's one doctrine. There is the doctrine of Christ. Would anybody in here disagree with that? There's one doctrine, right? So what, is he, what does the doctrine of Christ teach us? Well, there's a lot that it actually teaches us, but in part, Paul says, I, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Question, what is Paul writing here about? Who baptized who? No, we haven't got there yet. What's he writing about? He's addressing division in the church. You've got people in the church who are saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas. What are they doing? They're taking man's name on themselves. Isn't that what they're doing? When they say in the church, I am of Paul, isn't that following after a man rather than Jesus Christ? But when they say that, what are they referring to? That Paul was the one who brought them in to baptize them, brought them in the church? What are they referring to? Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I, I know what they're, do, what they're referring to, but I, it's based on Paul's argument that he didn't baptize many of them. I don't think that they would be saying that because he baptized them. Because he says, I didn't baptize that many of you. I believe what he's saying is that people tend to like certain teachers. They like certain personalities. They, they're drawn towards certain people, right? We know that. So it seems to me that, you know, Apollos was a very eloquent speaker. We know that from Acts chapter 19, 18 and 19, don't we? He was very well versed in the doctrine of Christ only he only knew the baptism of John right so he had to be pulled aside to be taught the word of God more accurately and when he did he went on his way and then Paul came through and saw some disciples there that were from Ephesus and he asked them into what were you baptized remember because they said they did they were baptized with the baptism of John because that's all Apollos knew at that time all right so the point is Paul you know, Paul, some were saying, I'm of Paul, and some are saying, I'm of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Now, what's funny is, that last group is right, because everyone who is born again is born of Christ. Okay, so Paul is not saying that if you say, I am of Christ, you're wrong or having division. No, actually, that's good. Anybody here who's not born of Christ? <laughs> Anybody willing to say that's a bad thing? Okay, it's not a bad thing, is it? Okay, it's a good thing. That is, matter of fact, the only one that can provide redemption for you and me is, is Jesus Christ. Okay, the problem is you've got these contentions in the church, and perhaps those who are of Christ were belligerent about it. Okay, perhaps they were fighting the other people, and instead of teaching them and helping them see with humility and things like that, perhaps it was adding to the contention. So he's dealing with division in the church. And this is talking, again, the, the, the area we're talking about right now is how do you know what the purpose of the author was? All right, well, this is kind of, this is pretty clear. 
<laughs> he says, I'm writing to you because Chloe tells me there's contentions among you. And here's what you're saying. So how does he deal with it? He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's his point? Let me ask you, is what he asking offensive? Or should he be asking these questions? Shouldn't he be asking these questions? Yeah. I'll read something to you um, that I posted today. And uh, it didn't, it, it's not necessarily returning good results, but it's okay. I had a conversation with somebody, okay? And I asked him a simple question. I asked him, I said, why is it, what is, why is it that the church you go to is called Lutheran? Okay, and it could have said anything. Okay, I'm not trying to single anybody out. I just happened to ask the question. Okay, and his response was because of Martin Luther. And I said, so Martin Luther founded the church. He said, yeah, I guess so. Well, in this conversation, I thought, okay, well, okay. I said, so does it belong to Jesus Christ? And he said, of course it does. My next question was, why is it called by a different name then? Why, in other words, Paul right here is saying, you're saying you're called by Paul. You're saying you're called by Cephas. You're saying you're called by Apollos. Is that a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. Okay? It's not a good thing. It's not good to, to create division in the church. And he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized, listen, what? In my own name. Now, what does it mean to be baptized in the name of somebody? What does that mean? By the authority of. By the authority of. Right? You ever heard, hopefully nobody's heard this on their door, but you ever heard somebody go, open up in the name of the law? Okay, what is that? What are they saying when they say that? By the authority of the law. What? By the authority they're, of the they're law. Telling you, I'm telling you to open your door because the law gives me that right. I have the authority to say that, and you need to do that based on the authority. So when somebody says, you're doing something in the name of somebody, it's by their authority. Okay, that's pretty easily understood. So Paul says, I am thankful that I didn't baptize many people, lest you guys would say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ, and here's another thing that people do when they come here. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. Another thing people do when they come here is they look at this and they say, See, baptism is not necessary for salvation because Paul said Christ didn't send him to baptize. Now, in today's study... We're going to be, hopefully, Lord willing, getting into the idea of context. All right? Context. When you want to know what something means, you put it in its context. All right? I was looking at something like uh, the word board. Not only do you have to spell it right so that you know what it means, because if I said board, and I asked you how to define that, some of the kids might say, I don't have anything to do. Right? How many times do we hear that from our kids? I'm bored. I'm bored until you teach them. Until you teach them, oh, you're bored? <laughs> I can give you something to do, right? Yeah. Bored. But what else is, what else does that word mean that's spelled the same way? B O R E D. Drilling a hole in a piece of wood. Drilling a hole in something, a piece of wood or something. We have bees that do that, don't they? Carpenter bees, what do they do? They bore holes in it. I have squash beetles at the house right now. What are they doing? They're boring holes in it. Okay? So that word has different meanings. 
What if I said, define the word bored and I didn't spell it for you? How difficult would it be to define that word? It could be a piece of lumber. It could be a piece of lumber, right? Bored? What else could it be? Getting on something. Huh? Getting on something, boarding a ship. Yep. What else could it be? Couldn't it be a committee of members that make decisions, like a board of directors? Yeah. Okay, so it has a lot of board. It could be a surfboard. It could be any number of things. When somebody says, hey, did you bring your board? A surfing term, that means your surfboard or your skateboard or something like that, or your boogie board, whatever, okay? So a word has meanings in its context, right? Phrases and sentences have meanings in its context. So if I just read, if I just opened my Bible and said, Paul said, now listen, Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. If I just took that, which is what many people do, and I ask you to tell me what that means, what would you say that means? I would say... <laughs> I would say I have to look at this in terms of context before I can answer that question. You're a bit of my class too long. <laughs> no, I'm talking like generally speaking, if you do that, what are you going to take that to mean? If I didn't have anything else. If you didn't have any context. Okay. Uh, I would say that uh, that wasn't his job. That isn't why Christ said. Okay. And if somebody said to you, well, Dick, then would you agree with me that baptism is not necessary for a person to be saved? I know, I understand that. But this is what people do with the Bible. They jump from one thing to the next, okay? Would you agree with me that Paul is saying baptism is not the important thing, therefore it's not necessary? This is what people do. I'm not asking you to agree with that statement. I'm asking you to see that's what people do. That's where they get their doctrines. They say, Paul is saying that baptism is not necessary because he said Jesus didn't send him to baptize. Jesus but the, doesn't baptize either. So, so what do you do with that? Our Lord and Creator. Well, then apparently it's he not important. He didn't baptize a single soul according to the Bible. Apparently it's not important if you take it the well, way most people do. <laughs> let's get with the program here. <laughs> so the, it's really a lack of study. People are not studying. It's a lack like of... We have Catholics and Lutherans and Seventh-day Adventists and Protestants and who knows what all the 700 denominations are. What book are they reading? Well, it's interesting that you say that because I had somebody post a response to that post I put on there. And they said it's very sad that, that some in your congregation believe that you're the only ones going to heaven, which... It's funny because and you didn't even say I didn't say that. I didn't even, what I said in my post was basically, if you call yourself after a man and you follow their doctrines, you're not following the doctrine of Christ. Because either you are following the doctrine of a man, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Smith, anybody else. I don't even care if it's Alexander Campbell or Martin Stone. Because guess what? Where they were wrong, they need to be rejected. It's not about them. It's not about men. It's about Jesus Christ, which is what Paul is saying here. He said, was, was, Paul, was Paul crucified for you? No. Jesus Christ is who is important. Amen? On the Mount of Transfiguration... John, Matthew 17. Peter, James, and John go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And what happens? Jesus is there. Luke tells the story also. Jesus is there. And with him appears Moses and Elijah. Moses represents what? Moses represents what? The law, right? The law. What does Elijah represent? The prophets. 
So standing on the Mount of Transfiguration was the law and the prophets, which is all of the Old Testament that Jesus came to what? Fulfill, Fulfill right? And Jesus is standing there. What does Peter say? Peter said, it is good for us to be here. Let us build a tabernacle, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. What does that mean? What was, what was, uh, what was Peter actually saying? What is a tabernacle? It's a dwelling place for them to coexist together, right? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. There is a cloud that overshadows them and speaks from heaven and says something profoundly important. What did it say? My beloved son, hear ye him. That's right. This is my beloved son, hear him. What does that mean? That means Jesus Christ is the authority. He came to establish a new covenant that has put away the old covenant, that has fulfilled it, and it became obsolete. Okay? Moses and Elijah are not where it's at anymore. Hear him. Jesus said to those who heard him on the Sermon on the Mount, He who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will consider to be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rains came, and the floods came, and the winds came, and beat upon that house, and it did not fall, because it was founded upon the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does not do them, I will liken to a foolish man, who built his house upon the sand, and the winds came, and the floods came, and the rains came, just like on the first house, and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Because it was built on the sand. You see, in getting in these discussions with people and helping people understand how you can understand the scriptures, people want to take what they want from the Bible, from the Word of God. They call themselves by whatever name they want to call themselves. They follow whatever man they want to follow. And they want to force Jesus to accept whatever twisted, convoluted, perverted doctrine they have decided to follow. And when they get to the judgment seat, what are they going to do? Are they going to stand before God and say, no, you must accept what this man said? Is that what people are really going to do? Well, they're going to be in for a rude awakening. But you know, um, to me, and I'm speaking for myself. I was a Roman Catholic. So when I made a decision to follow Christ, I also made a decision to give up some things which were very important to me. Things that, which I love dearly. Things that meant a lot to me. And these other people aren't willing to give up something in exchange for truth. They want to hold on to whatever they're holding on to. Did Jesus say that whoever believes in me should not be put to shame and will have everlasting life? Yes, he did. Whoever believes in me will not be put to shame, but will have everlasting life. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does that mean? Put that statement in its context. And what is the context of Jesus' statement? You have to put Jesus' statement in the rest of the context of Jesus' statements. Jesus also said, if anyone, Matthew 16, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. What does that tell me? What commentary does that give on the statement that whoever believes on me should not be put to shame, but have everlasting life. Doesn't that tell you what it means to believe in Jesus? Doesn't it give clarification that to believe in Jesus is to deny yourself, to pick up your cross, and to follow Jesus? Isn't that what that means? 
Or when Jesus says, He who loves mother and father more than me, or son or daughter, and so forth more than me, they are not worthy of me. In our world, people wear the name of Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic or whatever. And they want to stick it to themselves and say, I'm a Baptist and I'm a Christian and there's nothing you can say about it. Well, you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe there's nothing I can say about it. I'll tell you this much. Jesus said this in John chapter 12, verse 48. He said, he who rejects me. And by the way, if a person is following a doctrine other than the doctrine of Christ, whether they are actively or passively or ignorantly or purposefully or whatever, they are rejecting Christ. Because Jesus says this, and they say, no, 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 Jesus. No, no, it's just this. He who, re who, he who rejects me does not re re and does not receive what? My words. He who rejects me and does not receive my words. What does that mean? That we reject Jesus by rejecting his words, by not believing what he says, by not hearing him, by not doing what he says to do. We are rejecting his words, and by rejecting his words, we are rejecting him. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Not Martin Luther, not John Calvin, not John Smith, not Alexander Campbell, not Barton Stone, not Pope, whoever is in the, pl in the place of power. No man. But only Jesus Christ and his work. Chris. I guess I'm thinking when they say it's the work you know, of, of the Christian, whichever denomination they're calling themselves, and since most believe they can't be lost or chosen, who do they think is being talked about in the judgment scene where he separates the sheep from the goats? He said, didn't we do this in your name? That right there removes any other religion, Hindu, Buddhist, anybody like that, because they weren't doing it in his name. <coughs> only the people who call themselves Christian. So that means there's going to be Christians or people who call themselves Christian who aren't following and fit that. Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and they will say, yeah. Lord, Lord. Question. Would an unbeliever call Jesus Lord? Nope. Let's use a little exercise of common sense right now. Would an unbeliever call Jesus Lord? If they were trying to hide something from someone, yes, they're being deceitful, dishonest to them, but not to themselves. They know what they're doing. But does the listener know what they're doing? When Jesus says they're going to come to me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and that in your name? He's talking about people who believe in Jesus. Because people who believe in, people who don't believe Jesus are not doing anything in his name. Jesus is not denying in that statement. This is John Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is not denying that they did things in his name. Which means he's not denying that they believed. But what does he say happens to them? You didn't do what I told you to do. You didn't do what I told you to do. You thought you were a wise man. But in reality, you were a fool. Because you didn't do what I said. And I've got people who are saying to me, you guys are judgmental. You guys yep. believe you're the only ones going to heaven. All right, listen. Do you know who's going to get to heaven? Everyone God says is going to get to heaven. Do you know how we can make our calling and election sure? By doing what he says. By being obedient to his word. Okay? If we are not obedient, if we say, if we say, all you have to do is believe, faith only saves. If we make that statement, 
And the Bible, God's word, that which judges us, John chapter 12, verse 48, says otherwise. Are we doing the will of God? We're not. So what I would turn to James and say, well, the demons believe. Does that mean they're going to go to heaven like you? Because you believe and they both believe? Are the demons going to go to heaven? It's in inferences that, no, they're not God's people, but they believe. I wonder what they, you know, what they, what they would say about that verse. And Brian, back to verse 10 here. It says, Now I pray with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, yep. and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. So, we got a guy that just baptized yesterday, <coughs> talking to an elder about something from the Bible. Are they going to be of the same mind? Are they going to speak the same thing? Or will one's knowledge of the Bible say something different than the person who just baptized yesterday say about the Bible? So my point is, is are we all going to be of the same mind? Are we all going to be perfectly joined as new Christians and older Christians? Do you have a different opinion than I do about some of the verses in the Bible? My point is, is we are going to have different opinions about what's being said in the Bible, but we're not to cause divisions by what we believe or cause problems with the congregation by making a stand that will cause divisions in the church. I think it's the division thing that's more of the issue than about all thinking exactly alike is what I'm trying to say. But it is clear. There's one God, one faith, one baptism, one body, and one body. Whether you're new in the in the whether you're just whether you're just out just of the water, out of the water or up, that is the gospel. Yeah. Jesus Christ came and we're one faith, one body. Yet, that new Christian should be in unity with that. Will we be different in how we <coughs> present the gospel? Uh, will we have lingering things that come from our past that may challenge something that somebody says out of the scriptures yeah we're going to have those but we are to be working together in love and, and to come to a unity uh, I'm sure that there are certain things within this within the brotherhood that I don't see when somebody says it that's in the brother. And I'll give you an example. It took me a long, long, long time to see that instrumental music was not acceptable in the worship service. It took me a long, long, long time. Why is that? Because <coughs> that's what I believed all my life. Even though I was not part of the church, I knew that they had organs and they had this and they had that. I didn't see it. I see it now, but it took me some time. But that's that's part of being a Christian. If we stop learning and stop recommitting ourselves, then we're just lukewarm. But you also have, it's almost like you have, the difference here is not, not the issue of quality. The issue is a matter of quantity 
In other words, the new Christian has a far less quantity of knowledge, but the knowledge they have is qualitatively perfect. In other words, they it's the same quality. Okay? And so as you grow, grow in the now uh, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, okay? So it's not a matter of growth and it's not even a matter of amount of knowledge. It's because all of the knowledge that comes from the word of God, rightly divided, is perfect. It's perfect. No matter if it's this much that you know as a, as a newborn babe, or if it's all of it that you know. Okay? So the quality is the issue here. Okay? Paul, no doubt, understands that some people are going to have more knowledge than others. That's not the point. The point is they were following after men. And Paul condemned it. So, in our study today, one of the things I wanted to point out, which we're uh, uh, clearly not to get, going to get to the rest of them, because I, <laughs> all right, it's fine, it's, it's okay, no, it's okay, no, I actually, there's more in this book that I wanted to kind of get to you, but that's okay, it's all right, I'm not worried about it, I'm just, I'm just making a statement, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to want that line, is for bringing what it says here, and we're growing we should be striving to be of the same mind. It's not like somebody who gets elected to an office to make changes and bring in their own ideas. We're supposed to be following and trying to learn what what the scripture says and be the truth and striving to be of the same mind. Well, right. unity. Paul said, yeah. Paul said in Ephesians, take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you, verse 1, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. One. And they were all called to that same one. The same body, which is governed by the same Lord, that has the same faith and the same God over all. Okay? One. Go ahead. You're talking context. And part of context is, <clears throat> and it's very hard to get with the written word. Okay? Part of the context here is Paul is talking to Christians, mm -hmm. brothers yep. in the church. Yep. Now, is Paul screaming at them? Don't know. Don't know. Do we have any context? I mean, Paul's writing, so clearly he's not screaming at them because he's right. writing. Well, but I'm just saying. <laughs> What, okay. What's in Paul's mind? Is Paul is is Paul is Paul potentially angry with them? Yeah. Yeah. Potentially. Potentially. But we don't know that. Maybe he's saying, "Hey, there's division amongst you." Yeah. And you all don't even realize it. Or maybe and this they, is and this may be what's causing it. Or maybe they do realize it and don't care, because that's another maybe. thing that happened. And there we go again. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So what do we know about Paul? Does he teach the brethren and hold the brethren more accountable for the word? You should know better. Does he hold the Jews more accountable than he does the Gentile? You should know better. But how is he approaching these people? Well, let's, here's the thing about Versus it. Versus how is he approaching those that don't know God? Right. And here's the other part, though. See, I believe he would approach the same people, the, those who claim to know God, the same way he would approach these guys. In other words, you claim, 
the thing we don't have in the Bible, okay, we have people who crept in with Gnosticism. We have division that's crept in with the church. But the thing we don't have is, uh, you know, to Paul to the letter of the church at so and so. I want to talk to you about those people who call themselves Baptists or people who call themselves by. You see what I'm saying? That are following a different doctrine. The closest thing we have to that is Galatians chapter one, where he said, "I am marvel that you are so soon turned from the gospel of Christ to another gospel, which is not another gospel." But they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he said, I want to tell you something. If we, or an angel from heaven, come to you and preach any other gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. Okay? I can't imagine that Paul would be saying these things going, let him be accursed. <laughs> okay, I, don't, I can't imagine him being happy about this. But he goes to Athens. And he, yep. you have many gods here. Yep. Let me talk to you about yep. the unknown God. Do you think that he's addressing that audience in a way that would... I don't know. I'm not sure really what that has to do with this context other than... Well, the context is that Paul talking and what group he's talking to. Right. Okay. But he's, he's dealing with and division. Is Paul talking to these people in love or in anger? Because of, Why? Their, what, because, let me ask of you, because of their stupidity. Let me ask you a question. Why is love and anger mutually exclusive? It's not. Jesus was angry at times. Okay. But it was control it was anger without of course. sin. Of course. Okay. What I'm saying is, Paul may not have talked to those outside the church in the same tone that he talks to those inside the church. Okay. okay. I think he would have he would. Hold people more accountable to what they're believing if they're members of the church versus people who are not members of the church. They're ignorant. They don't. They don't know what they believe. So you're. I, and if I were Paul, I would feel a lot less emotion towards those people than I would to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, let's go to the program. You're supposed to know the truth. Yeah, I guess the hard thing I'm having a hard time here as as the one who's teaching the class, and I'm looking at the context. The manner of delivery is not discussed. Okay, I'm not quite sure why the class is going in that direction. The the the, the point that I'm trying to make here, I, I can tell you why it's going that direction. Go ahead. Okay, and this isn't a, it isn't a criticism, but I see your passion. Yeah. And and what how you say you're dealing with these people that will not agree. With you. They won't agree with the scripture. They won't agree with the scriptures, but again, you're taking it on personally. And I'm just saying, would Paul be talking to somebody outside the church in the same level of passion and... Let me ask you a question. When Jesus spoke, did he ever get upset with the Pharisees? Absolutely. Did he get upset with their hypocrisy? Absolutely. Did he get upset with their claims to be the children of God? Absolutely. And he said, you are not the children of God. Absolutely. Okay. So let me broaden the view. Okay. Because we're not dealing with people who are professing to be innocent victims of a doctrine. We have people who are actively teaching people false doctrines, and when they're confronted with the truth, they blow back in your face this garbage. And when that happens, and you're dealing with it all the time, 
it gets to where you get frustrated. Okay, so I'm not talking to the members of the church. I'm talking to those who would be like the Pharisees. They would be like the Sadducees. They would say, well, if baptism is necessary, then why does Paul say God didn't send me to baptize? And I say that because the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22 and said, um, let me ask you a question. If their implication is that the resurrection is real, then, hey, listen, Moses said that if a man dies and he leaves his wife without any children, his brother's supposed to take her. And then he died. And they gave this story about how seven brothers had her. And they put this in a religious context. And Jesus said, you neither know the scripture nor the power of God. And then he went on to talk to the Pharisees about what the greatest commandment is and who's my neighbor and all these things that they try to trip them up with. Okay, So we're not talking to people who are coming to me going, you know what, I am confused about this. You and I were talking about this and I really want to know what's true. No, we're talking about people who are blatantly teaching false doctrines and when they're confronted with the truth, they reject it and call us things like cult and all that kind of stuff. Which, by the way, lines right up with 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 tells us there will be false teachers, false prophets, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, which is what's happening, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. That means when somebody comes by and speaks the truth, they're going to speak against it. We need more passion. We need more people who will stand up and say, no, you got people out there that are fighting for all these things that don't matter in the realm of eternity, and they're as passionate as you can be about it. Yet, when somebody comes and they're passionate about the gospel, it's almost like, whoa, settle down. And the problem I have with that is we need more passion. We need people who are going to be willing to stand up to these people and tell them, no, you can't do that. You can't be a person who is called after a man's name, following a man's doctrine, and expect to find yourself in the company of the sheep on the judgment day. So have you ever heard of the book called His Utmost for His Highest, or Our Utmost for yes. His Highest? Do you know who wrote that book? Yes. A Baptist. Do you know in the back of that book and the concordance where they have all the reference pages back there, they talk about everything, everything about the gospel plan of salvation, but the word baptism. If you open the concordance up to this book, how many times is the word baptism mentioned in the concordance of one of these books? It's not mentioned once in the back of that book, his utmost for its highest. They have belief in there, they have confession in there, they have repentance in there, they have faith, they have salvation, but they don't have the word baptism in there. One of the problems. This person is highly educated, very knowledgeable about the scriptures, mm -hmm. but he's a Baptist, and isn't that ironic? He's a Baptist, and the word baptism is not mentioned once yeah. in that book. The reason the Baptists are called Baptists is not because of baptism. It's something other than that. I understand. But we'll, that. Get, we'll get into that. You my, talk about the hypocrisy. My point is this. If you look at back when the Church of Christ was growing, we had passionate preachers. We had preachers who were willing to stand up, stick their necks out, to hold gospel meetings, to hurt people's feelings by stepping on their toes. 
and by teaching the gospel and proclaiming the gospel and giving hellfire and brimstone and helping people understand that this ain't no joke. And that's what I am trying to do. Jude said something that's very important to this discussion. Jude said this, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, this is verse 20 and 21 following, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and on some, on some have compassion. That means you've got a person who's looking for the truth and you say, come here, let me show you what's true. Let me help you out of your confusion. Sit down and have these Bible studies with me. Have some coffee. Here's some donuts and we'll sit down and talk about it. And you share tears with them. You share the gospel with them and you can see that their desires for the truth. They just don't know it. And then he says this, but others save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. There is not just one way to talk to people. Some people need an arm around them. Some people need hellfire and brimstone. They need to know that if they die and they're in their sin or they're following some man, they're going to die in their sins and they will not see life. So when you spoke to this person today, did you make it very clear to them that you felt that they were on the road to hell? And, and you know, how, did they, how would they have responded to that? Or what did they say to that? Because that sounds like we need what you need to say to this person. You need to shake them up a little bit. I said to them, he said, I said, why is it called after Martin Luther's name? He said, because it's the doctrine of Martin Luther that it's followed. I said, then it belongs to Martin Luther. If you're following Martin Luther's doctrine, if you're following Martin Luther's commandments, you are following Martin Luther. That church belongs to Martin Luther, period. And then I said, so you aren't Christians, but Lutherans. As a matter of fact, that's what they say. What are you? I am a Lutheran. Why is it when I point it out and tell them that, they become offended all of a sudden? You're not a Christian. You're a Lutheran. <clears throat> he said, we are Christians. I said, then why are you called Lutherans? He said, because we follow Martin Luther's teaching. There again, going right back to that. I know this isn't popular. I know this is going over the World Wide Web. I understand that. But it's the truth. Thank Jesus you. said, if you abide in my word, not Luther's or any other person's word. If you abide in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They're, they're taking the world view of that of the term Christian. Of course. If you're not if you're not a Jew, if you're not a Muslim, then you must be a Christian. So I said to them, I said he said, We follow the what Martin Luther taught about the Bible. I said, So you obey the doctrine of Martin Luther? He said, Yes. And I quoted two passages. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. If you're following the doctrine of Martin Luther, you are not following the doctrine of Christ. Because if you were, you wouldn't be following the Martin Luther the doctrine. You understand what I'm getting at? Because if they were one and the same, you wouldn't have two different bodies. Two different teaching well, so two different practices either. they wouldn't be so defensive either They're saying you're, you're part of the cult whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God question if you don't have God are you a Christian if you do not have God are you a Christian somebody help me Absolutely. no so if you're following another doctrine the Bible plainly teaches that you are not a Christian because you do not have God. And he said, I said, if you don't obey the doctrine of Christ with the doctrine of Martin Luther, you, have, you don't have God, you are not a Christian. He said, you can't say that. I said, I didn't. 
God did. I said either way, either we obey and abide in the doctrine or, or word of Jesus Christ, or we obey and abide in the perverted gospel which will lead us to our being accursed. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. He was silent, and I said this. I said, Jesus built his church. It began on the first Pentecost after his resurrection. I gave him both passages, Matthew 16, Acts 2. And that he adds those who gladly receive his word and are baptized for the remission of the sins to the church, Acts chapter 2. He didn't say anything. I gave him a card so let's study some more and that ended the conversation. So I posted that on Facebook and I said, the Church of Christ greets you. That's right out of the Bible. I said, it is the one body, the church, the bride, the precious possession of Jesus Christ. There is only one, Ephesians 4, 1 through 4, one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, one. I said, pray that eyes and ears are open to God's truth, that people will see the error that of man-made institutions that are counterfeit churches. Pray that they will seek the doctrine of Christ and put away man-made denominations and follow only that which will save their souls. The implanted word, James 1.21, that's what I put out there. That's exactly what I put out there, and this is the type of response we get. So, people are lost. Yeah, and there's a ton of bad soil out there too, Brian. Yeah, I'm not, wor I, I'm not really worried about the soil. I, I, what I'm concerned with is when you have people who are lost and you tell them the truth, they're more like the Pharisees than they would be the general population out here. Go ahead. This is something that helped me early on. And you said, here's why we didn't have a creed or a man's doctrine. Okay, so well, if there's more than what's in the Bible, you're adding to the Word. If it's less than what's in the Bible, you're taking away from the Word. If it's right. the same as what's in the Bible, then why do you need it? Exactly. Well, there are at least three times in the Scriptures once in Deuteronomy, once in the Psalms, once in Revelation. Where God has said, do not add to nor take away from the words of this book. Think about it. Deuteronomy, what's that? The law. The law. Proverbs. Proverbs would be the prophets. Actually, David was a prophet. And Revelation. New Testament. Every aspect of God's word, when he gives it, he says, don't tamper with it. <clears throat> and yet that's what people do every single day. And they're walking their path along the wide path of destruction. And they don't even know it. But do you think they're studying the Bible diligently? No. I don't. That's why when I said... To this particular person, he said, I read the same book you do and other things. I said, You you may read the same book, I said, but if you don't do it, it doesn't really matter. If you don't diligently study it, if you don't rightly divide it, if you don't do what he says, it doesn't matter. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, would you not say they were well versed with the Old Testament law? Well, I would say that they were very well versed in the tradition of the elders. Well, they must have had some knowledge of the Old Testament, but you know, my point is, is they weren't doing what the Old Testament told them to do, just like Jesus is telling people living under the New Testament, you're not doing what I told you to do. I guess the thing, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, Jesus told them very often that what they thought they knew wasn't what they should have known. You have heard that it was said to those of old, right? Do not commit adultery, but I say to you this. You've heard that it was said that those do not murder, but I say to you this. Jesus wasn't changing the law. He was clarifying it because by their interpretation of the scriptures, they took the power of God's word away from themselves and away from the people. That's why Jesus said they cross over land and sea and make one proselyte, and they make that one person a, twice the son of hell as they themselves are. So this person that you were teaching or talking to today, why do you think, what do you think his 
was holding him back from accepting truth? <clears throat> well, in this particular case, it was probably his job. Was he a preacher? No, I would say that had a huge bearing on, on his response. See, he had something to give up. And that's one of the greatest barriers to people becoming Christians. Because if everybody in the world was a Christian, it would be easy to be a Christian. But the world's not filled with Christians. So that's why it's a lot harder to get on board with that one narrow way of thinking. Yeah, it's a narrow path. It's difficult. And there's few who find it. Brian, in my experience as a Christian trying to teach, well, if my my grandmother is going to go to hell so she can be with her husband and that's what she wants. She wants to go to hell and be with her husband. Words right out of her mouth. Yeah. I will not take truth over my husband. I want. I, there's no marriage in heaven anyway, so what's that all about? Well, the problem, well, they wouldn't believe that either. Well, here's the problem, Dick. He who loves mother, father, son, or daughter, husband, or wife, or whatever more than me is not worthy of me why I said that. Because people will do that. Anything else? Okay. What's our song again? 402. 402. Alright. I will hand the class over. <laughs>